Hey, welcome everybody to another episode of Inside Enduro. Today we're going to switch it up with a little medical science. It's going to be pretty interesting. You're going to learn some things. Anyone who's had a little arm pump, you may want to listen to this. Today we have a great guest, Dr. Joseph C. McGinley. He's a medical doctor and a PhD. This guy is pretty much probably went to school longer than all of us combined. So welcoming Dr. McGinley. How you doing, man? Great. Uh, glad to be on the show today. Uh, excited to, to talk about some of this stuff and, and hopefully we can get, give some insight into arm pump and, and talk about some easy ways to, to take care of it. Cool. Well, I think a lot of people will be looking forward to it. We're still trying to figure out the whole Zoom since, uh, you know, it's hard to, uh, you know, be in person these days. So hopefully this will all work out. So we're live, so it should be pretty should be pretty exciting. But first of all, it's pretty interesting. Not only are you a medical doctor, but I believe you had a undergraduate and a master's in mechanical engineering. Uh, that's correct. So you know, I, my background's in mechanical engineering, and uh, spent a lot of time in engineering, and and transitioned to medicine uh, naturally. To me, you know, I, I see the human body as as an engine, just like uh, we worked on back in uh, undergraduate and graduate uh, programs, and and that's how I, I approach problems. You know, when we see problems with patients, uh, we try to look for the underlying reason that's causing those issues, and then fix that problem to help alleviate the symptoms. That's pretty cool. I had one of my friends, you know, as well, I've been involved in orthopedics for well over 25 years. And I think one of the surgeon's jokes was, is that a guy who fixed Harley's said, Hey, you know, I can fix, you know, this, this engine. So why shouldn't I be as, as paid as, as much as you do? And, and the surgeon and the surgeon replied, well, imagine if you fix that Harley engine, while the engine was running as you rebuilt it that's the difference <laughs> that's probably one of the differences and then the other ones are the attorneys right you know <laughs> true true yeah it's it's like you better you better have a good shark suit or shark cage yeah but you know that that gets down to the basics of it you know the, the body is just a complex uh, mechanical system and uh, it, it's great looking at it that way uh, you know to, you got to keep things simple and that's uh, uh that's the approach we we try to take so as i recall somewhere back in the day you had some experience with dirt bikes so we have a huge <laughs> dirt bike audience we're obviously going to talk about forearm pump so what were you getting up to as a kid on these on these dirt bikes? Man, you know, I think I'm still a kid on those dirt bikes. So I, I raced uh, motocross and uh, even some amateur arena cross and supercross uh, back in the day. Even up through med school, I, I was out there uh, racing and, and competing. And, uh, you know, I, I raced back on the East Coast. So English Town, uh, that was one of the big locations I was at all, all up and down the coast. Raced at Bud's Creek a few times. Uh, some of the national uh, courses out there. Um, so, I, you know, I love it. I, I grew up racing. Um, I, I'm still uh, uh, ride my uh, dirt bikes on the weekend. I have a son now who uh, races, and it's great to get out there with him. You know, I have a, a couple pictures coming up in the slides here. That's, that's the two of us getting out there on the weekend. So uh, take care of people during the week and then get out there and get on the bikes on the weekend. So, you know, I, I'm familiar with arm pump. I mean, it's uh, uh, it can be a problem, that's for sure. And and, uh, you know, getting out there and experiencing it, that, that, that makes you a better physician. Cause if you know, if you know what you're talking about and you know, the details and, and you know exactly what the problem is, um, then you can relate to the patient better. You can relate to an individual. So I try to, I try to use that excuse with, with my wife to get a new dirt bike. I said, you know, this is for medicine. It's for practicing medicine. <laughs> well, I hope, and I hope you're writing it off. It's, uh, it's well, I mean, I can't do I can't do that yet. I think I I think my accountant will. Uh, I think I'll get in trouble with my account. It's a test. It's that. a test vehicle. I mean, how can you truly test arm pump? It's like a dynamometer, like a hand gripper, but it's the real thing. Don't uh, worry. Yeah. I'll write. Yeah, you, I'll write you a note. <laughs> um, that'll be perfect. I might try that. So tomorrow I'm going to go in and, and talk to my account and see if that flies. I'll, I'll let you know. <laughs> Just have them talk to Inside Enduro. We, we can give you a note and uh, you'll be okay. I promise. Good. Good. So, Good. And it's pretty interesting. Now, you're in Casper, Wyoming, yes. which 
I don't think a lot of people in the world know where Casper, Wyoming even is. I do. I mean, coming from Eastern Montana, there was actually a rugby team out of Casper. They were the Casper Cannibals. Oh, wow. So I don't know if they've long deceased, possibly. Uh, you know, I'm not familiar with uh, with rugby out here in Casper right now, but, you know, even getting out here to Casper, that's that's a unique story. And and being able to develop a medical practice here is part of that story. I'm, as I just mentioned, I'm from the East Coast. I'm from right outside Philadelphia. My wife's from that area. I grew up there. Uh, and then I did the rest of my medical training out on the West Coast out at Stanford. So, you know, two big metro areas and then ended up uh, settling in central Wyoming. But part of the reason that I settled out here is, is just like, you know, probably a lot of your listeners had no idea where it was or even, you know, what goes on in Casper. That's what really attracted me to it. I mean, you've been here, just wide open roads, beautiful mountain, lakes, rivers, streams. Um, everything is so close by and, and easily accessible. You can get outside and enjoy the outdoors in, in literally five, 10 minutes. Um, you know, back on the coast, it takes five to 10 minutes just to get to your car. Uh, to drive anywhere. <laughs> Whereas, you know, here you can load up the dirt bikes after work and go out riding in 10, 15 minutes and you're back by dinner. I mean, it, the, the quality of life is exceptional and, and uh, you know, it's beautiful out there. It really is great country out there. Well, that's pretty cool. I appreciate your description because at first when I looked at how much education you had and what you did, the first thing that came to mind was federal witness relocation program. And then maybe well, on, you know. <laughs> then on the back of the shirt, it says, you don't know me. <laughs> well, after your last uh, tax advice there, I might need to hide out here a little bit. So <laughs> we'll see how that goes. But, uh, oh, yeah. you well, know, all, it, it's great. Yeah. All, my, all my tax advice comes with an asterisk. So, <laughs> Good. well, cool. Well, we're going to look at some of your slides. You have a really interesting setup of and completely innovative. You've patented this procedure. I have researched it a ton and you're the only one that's doing this. There are other alternatives that didn't look so awesome to me that were surgical. And uh, so we'll go through those. You've been in, surprisingly, in 2019, I think you're in Dirt Bike Magazine, Motocross Action Magazine. And I was kind of surprised that, you know, there wasn't, you know, more out there. But then again, you know, in these print publications, uh, a lot of people aren't reading anymore. So, yeah, you know, it's unfortunate. I was, uh, uh, you know, again, growing up, uh, these are the magazines I subscribed to. And, uh, you know, when, when the uh, editors first reached out to do a story on this, um, uh, you know, I was really excited. I mean, you know, it was like I was uh, 15 again and out there racing. And to get a story in one of these magazines, I mean, I, I can't tell you how excited I was. Uh, being a former uh, uh, competitive motocross racer. Um, but yeah, a lot of stuff's going digital. Uh, you know, they obviously publish these digitally on their on their sites as well. Uh, but the media format changes and trying to disseminate that information and getting it out there um, is a little bit more different uh, than just putting it in a magazine. And, and you know, that's why we're having this conversation and uh, chatting about your experience here a little bit. I, I think that's helpful. And, and for your listeners out there, um, you know, I always encourage people to, to look, to, to search all these things, see what the options are and see what works best for them. And, and hopefully this, uh, after we discuss this, say, we'll have a little bit more insight on what arm pump is and, and how we address it. Well, cool. Well, we're pretty well known for cutting through the fluff here. So, uh, yeah, <laughs> we're going to get, we're going to get the real, we're going to get the real story out. So, well, cool. Good. Well, let's, let's try and hit one of the first slides and we'll go from there. It's better. All right, so let's roll with that. So we have, there it is, arm pump. Engine awesome. failure. Yeah, you Ooh. know, uh, this, is, this is what we'll chat about here. Again, uh, I'm gonna try to make the analogy, getting back to the mechanics, is that um, uh, arm pump essentially is, is your failure of the forearms. And when that happens, uh, you know, you really find it hard to compete, right? It's hard to hold on, hold the grips. It's hard to shift. It's hard to hit the brake lever. Uh, so, you know, this really is failure of the, of the muscles of the pumps of the forearm. And, and we'll talk about that. We'll see what that means here in just a minute. Uh, yeah, um, I, yeah, I think it's, part, it's, I, I think it's all of those things. And I think you can almost add depression in as well, <laughs> because, <laughs> you know, for me, <clears throat> if you remember like the circus bears or the Russian bears that ride the tiny little bicycles, well, if you have paws, they just kind of push on the bars 
And that's pretty much what's going on. And that's what I've been doing for the last few years is my forearms would blow out so bad that I was basically the circus bear just kind of pushing with my paws and really just trying to stay on the bike. And it was torturous. And, you know, that's why I'd been researching for the last couple of years and came across your work and then kind of put that through you know, my medical contacts and, and my own experience and said, Hey, I think, I think this, I think this guy has something here. Yeah. I, I think you, I think you need an animation there of the, uh, of the bear. <laughs> for, well, there, for the, if anyone needs yeah, any that's... animation of the circus bear, just go to inside Enduro Instagram and you can see uh, videos of me writing and it's very similar. Um, the clum but, you clumsy know, bear. You, you, well, you, you hit on some really good points there. I mean, you know, that, that pain and discomfort um, can be minor in some people, but really when that gets severe, not only does it affect your ability to ride, it affects your enjoyment, right? Because then, you know, you, you start to anticipate it and you're not looking forward to getting out there on the bike like you used to. Um, you know, you think that this is going to end your ability to ride. Uh, so it does have a psychological component for sure. And, you know, if you can imagine, if you can't grip the handlebars, I mean, how are you going to push hard? How are you going to do jumps with confidence? How are you going to really get out there and, and ride? And, you know, you'll see it with racers or even uh, recreational riders on the weekend that it can be some, come such a problem that they, they quit the sport. And, you know, that that's unfortunate because, you know, there, there are solutions out there and, uh, we want to get people out there and get them uh, to be able to do what they want to do and, and be able to get out there and ride. And, you know, again, we can talk through other solutions besides what I do in surgery uh, to help with that. But, you know, the goal is to make sure people are happy and out there and enjoying the outdoors. That That's really the, the whole point of this. Yeah. I, I mean, I can't reiterate enough on the depression side where, quite honestly, I typically haven't said much about it where... I've spent so much money and time and effort and training and, you know, say I'm over in Europe doing a race and for the first hour and a half, I'm thinking, why did I come here? I hate this. I think I am genetically uh, barred from doing this. Whatever genes I have, I'm not meant to do this, but I'm such a stubborn ass that I just push through. And the only thing that drags me back is after an hour and a half or so, then it goes away to some extent and I'm able to start passing and, and actually, you know, put together a reasonable, uh, definitely a reasonable performance for, you know, my experience and, and who I am. And, and that's what keeps me coming back. And you're totally right. When you start to think, it's not just like if it's going to happen, it's like how bad it's going to happen. And that's a, that's a real crappy way to start. And same, I think even with recreational riders, it's like, if you have a guy who's going out and he's riding with his moto group buddies and you know, he wants to be in the mix or she wants to be in the mix and they're just, you know, suffering horribly. They're just not enjoying it. It's not fun. That's right. Yeah. And, and again, you know, it's that anticipation of it instead of focusing on what you're doing. And, and, you know, hey, we all know this is a this is can be a dangerous sport if you're not comfortable on the bike or if you're not riding correctly. And, you know, if you're starting from uh, the first moment you throw your leg over the bike, if you're worrying about your forearms and arm pump, then you're not focusing on what you're doing out there. And that can be a distraction. So there's also a, uh, you know, a safety component of that that I, I think also gets overlooked and um, you know, uh, you got to have focus out there. You got to pay attention to what you're doing and, and you got to enjoy it. Right. Otherwise it, it's, it becomes work instead of just riding. So yeah, there, there's a lot of other uh, pieces to this puzzle besides just the physical component, uh, of arm pump. I, I love the, I love the facts where you say, this is a real problem and extremely frustrating. You are not crazy. And there was a point for me that I thought definitely arm pump is in a lot of ways a psychological thing that manifests into a physical thing. And I still believe some of that may be true because there's some things you can do to relax yourself and, you know, better fitness, better diet. But I can tell you, I have pushed all those things to a point 
that it was beyond you know for me there was there was no doubt whatsoever that it was a definitely a physical a physical problem and you know I could make it better but there was nothing you know that I could do to to make it to make it go away and like you said it can be really dangerous if you're doing a big feature and you need to pull the trigger on your clutch operation and you have to have very specific throttle response and clutch response and you don't feel comfortable that you can time it for something with consequence yeah it sucks it's not a it's not a fun place it can be a dangerous place yeah absolutely and, and and the fact where you know people think it's it's all mental i mean you know and i think we should probably be clear that there's different categories of arm pump. So, you know, on, on that last slide, you saw a picture there, me and my son, we first got our uh, uh, bikes and I went out on the track and that was the first time on that bike and I hadn't been out in a while. Um, my forearms felt like they were five times as big as normal. So uh, <laughs> the solution on that one was practice and, and get out there a little bit more. And, and sure enough, you know, the next few rides, uh, that was no longer an issue. But I, I, I literally had a problem getting my jersey off. My forearms are so big. And, you know, that, that was just, for me, that was just from a lack of practice and, and a lack of getting out there. Um, so in those situations, you know, I don't need medical treatment or surgery or anything else. That, that's more on the uh, conservative side where, um, you know, you get out there and practice, you, you do the repetitive exercises, you do the stretching, all of the basics that you should try first. And you hit the nail on the head. You know, if someone's been out riding for years and they go out and get arm pumped this weekend, do they need treatment? Probably not. Uh, it may have just been a bad day, it may have been, you know, a new setup on their bike. Uh, so there's all these other things that, that should be attempted first before we're um, you know, anyone is, is seeking medical intervention. And, and in your point, you did. I mean, you tried literally everything and it was affecting your ability to compete, is affecting your ability to train. And uh, that's when you seek medical intervention. That's when you seek uh, medical treatment beyond the basics. And those categories should be, you know, should be clear because, you know, again, you don't want people getting unnecessary medical care. I mean, that, that's not helpful really for anyone. Um, but the crazy part, you know, that that's a real thing. You know, I, I see people that have arm pump, but uh, this problem also uh, occurs in the calves too, in, in runners, soccer players, things like that. And you'll get these parents that have their kids, uh, doctors all around the country and, and the, the patients, and they're usually young, they're usually 17, 18 years old. They, they start to think that it's mental at that point because they've seen all these doctors, they couldn't identify the problem, they couldn't fix the problem. Um, so they, they really do think it, that, that they're uh, crazy to some degree. And, and that's unfortunate because uh, it, that's really not the case. This is a real problem, it is a real physiology. Uh, there are mechanics associated and it is frustrating. And I think that's the biggest point is this really is a frustration for a lot of people. Cool, well, we're gonna figure out one way to mitigate it. So let's move on. We got. Perfect. I'll, uh, anyway, I'll switch to the next slide here. So um, let's first define what this is, right? So arm pump, everyone knows what it is generically. Though any of us who have ever put a leg over a motorcycle uh, know what arm pump is. But from the medical side, what it really is is chronic exertional compartment syndrome of the forearm. So fancy name for arm pump, uh, but essentially uh, exertional compartment syndrome of the forearm. Uh, now, you can see it in all types of motorcycle racers, on, off-road, motocross, enduro, uh, uh, superbike racing. Uh, we've even um, uh, treated some um, uh, BMXers as well, uh, some stunt racers uh, we've had as well, a freestyle. Uh, so, you know, it's the whole mix of anyone that's having that gripping motion or has the uh, 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 need for grip, uh, mountain bike riders, downhill racers, and then even tennis players, right? Gripping a tennis racket, you can get arm pump with that. Um, so uh, arm pump can occur in all these situations and the medical diagnosis for it is chronic exertional compartment syndrome. And if people look that up, you'll see, yep, that's exactly what I have. <laughs> so I uh, wanna make sure we get that out there and, and uh, make sure that people know that they can also see it when they're training on any of these other uh, type of gripping type exercises. Well, I, th I believe I saw a mountain bike article that they found a correlation between the top downhill mountain bikers grip strength to success and the racers that had the highest grip strength 
typically were the top placers. There was a correlation with grip strength and podium. Yeah, and, and, and you know that that would make sense, right? If they're um, maneuvering or manipulating uh, uh, the bike in a in a very um, uh, high energy manner, uh, that that would relate to performance. And and what you're probably getting at is with arm pump, you start to lose that grip, you start to lose that grip strength. So uh, arm pump does have a direct correlation with performance and and lack of performance, really. Uh, that as this creeps in or become more prominent you do start to lose grip strength. I mean, you know, it, it just uh, anyone that has it, um, you can't hold on to the handlebars. You talked about the club hands. I mean, that's just cause you can't move your fingers. You can't grip your fingers anymore. And uh, that, that diminishes grip strength and, and it doesn't happen just like a light switch. It usually is gradual. So you'll start losing grip strength over time. And then you start to ride atypically, which worsens the arm pump. And then it, it's sort of a downward spiral from there. Oh yeah. I've been accustomed to the uh, four finger, clutch engagement which uh is no fun and then when you get to the point where you use all four fingers and it's all you can do to pull in the clutch which always makes me laugh when you see people in a showroom or rock up to a new dirt bike and they just give it the light little you know the light little index finger test you know it's like oh this this feels a little harsh it's like you know, when you think about it and you've got all four fingers and you're like, grr, and it's everything you can do to bring back a hydraulic clutch, you know, you got your hand over and everything else. Yeah. It's uh... <laughs> yeah. I've actually, I've, I believe at some point I've reached over and used my elbow and, and brought it back because I had just as much grip and dexterity with the end of my uh, elbow as I did with my hands. So we need, we need some video clips for that. That's uh, that's for sure. I'll see what I can do. I'll I'll add it. I'll add it to the circus bear clip. <laughs> and and you know this next slide here. I mean this this really highlights it. And and the picture on the left with the tourniquet. I'm going to circle back to that at the end of this talk here because um, what I want to do is try to make the point that this picture over here with the tourniquet. That's what happens when when you give blood. So if anyone is has given blood or had to go to the doctor to get a blood draw, they put the tourniquet on the arm and all the veins pop out. That looks pretty similar to what we're seeing on the right side here uh, of the racer and, and the arm pump that they're experiencing in that right image. So uh, towards the end here, we're gonna circle back to this uh, tourniquet picture and, and hopefully that makes sense because that's what arm pump is. The, the picture on the left is essentially arm pump without jumping on the motorcycle. Uh, the picture on the right is, is after uh, pushing it hard out there on the bike and that's what the forearm looks like. How, my, my arm looks like the picture on the right when I wake up in the morning. You know, can you explain that? I, I don't know why it, it always looks like that. It's probably part of my part of, part of my problem. I'd imagine, yeah, you know, your forearms are a bit different than most of us too. I mean, let, let's get that out there as well. <laughs> <It's>, uh... <laughs> yeah. They're, they're unfortunately, I wish they could be smaller, but they're, they're bigger than the average person's neck circumference. Exactly. Um, so, you know, again, getting into the, the cause of it and, and the title of this of engine failure of the forearm. Um, again, I like to keep things simple. I, I like to go back to the mechanical engineering and the mechanics. And, you know, I, I, I used to work on my engines all the time uh, uh, when I was racing. And this is essentially the exact same example. So, you know, for a combustion engine, uh, you have the intake valve, you have the intake coming in, you have the combustion and power generation uh, within the engine, and then you have the exhaust uh, where the, the byproducts of the combustion leave the engine. So you have fuel coming in, you have the activity centrally, and then you have the byproducts leaving. That's what happens in the engine. In the forearm, it's the exact same thing. Uh, so the, the engine are the, are the muscles and the artery uh, are the intake. So if you see on that picture on the bottom right, uh, the artery is the intake. Uh, so that's all of the fuel coming in. This area here that says capillary, uh, that's what's in the muscle. So that's where the muscle extracts the fuel. That's where it gets all its nutrients. After that occurs, uh, you have activity in the muscles, and then you have the vein carrying out the byproducts of that combustion process. Um, so intake, power generation, and exhaust uh, is what you see in the muscle. So exact same process as far as how I see it. Um, you know, obviously there's a little bit difference in the mechanics, but general concept, uh, that's what, you know, I'm sort of getting at with the mechanical engine failure in the forearm. Gotcha. Well, yeah, I mean, your engine doesn't go long. If you can't, if you can't pour it off the exhaust, it's just, well, put a banana in your tailpipe, see what happens. 
And, and that's exactly what happens here uh, in the in the forearm with compartment syndrome or arm pump. So if you can imagine that the tailpipe over here is the vein, and if you clamp off this vein, uh, it, it blocks everything up into the engine, which is at the capillaries, and then that results in lack of performance in the muscles. So yeah, the, the banana in the tailpipe is the compression on the veins and, and the, the buildup. Uh, everyone's heard of lactic acid buildup. Uh, that starts to occur in these muscles. So the fluid starts to accumulate, lactic acid starts to accumulate, and that's what starts generating that pain and pressure that people feel with arm pump. And it actually, as you see the capillaries, it actually pushes the fluid outside the capillaries themselves as well, correct? Yeah, that, that's correct. So the, the physiology here, uh, these capillaries are leaky. So that's how uh, nutrients get across from the artery into the muscle. So it's actually like a, like a filter and fluid goes back and forth in and out of the muscle. Um, and, and it's a, essentially a pressure gradient. And if you, if you increase the pressure on the outflow, that backs up to the capillaries. And because those are leaky, the fluid essentially will leak out into the muscle. And we'll show that on your images uh, in particular, where you can actually see the fluid. It, it looks bright on MRI scans when fluid accumulates. And, and that's what you're feeling. So, the, you know, your, your skin is a fixed layer uh, in your forearm and, and it holds everything in place. Each of these muscles are surrounded by a tight fascia, almost like a covering. And when that fluid starts to fill uh, and leak from the capillary into the muscle, they, the muscles physically do enlarge and they get bigger. And there is only a certain amount of space that that can occur in, in the forearm until you start feeling it as pain and pressure. And then that, that inhibits the ability for the, for the muscles to even work. Uh, so you're absolutely right. The, the capillaries are leaky. That's where the problem occurs. Uh, the fluid leaks across and, and it causes swelling within the muscles. So visual swelling, actual swelling, ultimately resulting pain and pressure. Gotcha. All right, some of the treatments again and most of us who've had this have probably tried at least you know a couple of these things and they're pretty common you know as far as setting your bike up right trying to get warmed up which that's always kind of an interesting thing when you do a lot of the the hard enduros it just seems like the starts aren't always depending where you go that organized and you're out somewhere and they're like, all right, well, uh, riders meeting, uh, then it's 15 minutes late and you're like, okay, let's go. And so you're basically starting an athletic event with no real warm up, where you see the supercross guys. I just saw a video clip and they went through and if you see in the back, you know, you catch these guys are on trainers or they're on an assault bike getting warmed up before a moto. And I think that makes it worse. I don't know if it's physiologically true that if you did pump your legs up a bit and you had your leg muscles that had their, their share of the blood volume as well, that if you took off like a wild animal, it would take longer to get that blood to your forearms if it's being utilized in your legs. Yeah, you know, um, as far as getting the blood flowing, that that's just overall. So even though you're uh, exercising with your leg muscles, your your heart rate's increasing, and that changes a lot of the physiology uh, in in all of your muscles. And you know, you, you have different um, uh, levels of change within the blood vessels directly. There's sensors in in blood vessels, receptors are called, and they can change how constricted they are, how tight they are. Um, so you know, even just warming up in general. Uh, in any way, shape, or form uh, helps with both upper and lower extremity. You're right. If, if they just uh, get a race started and, and you don't have time to get warmed up or don't know how long you have to get started, you, you know, that, that's just a situation with that uh, particular race. There's not much you can do about that. But whenever possible, any, any amount of warm-up, whether it's just jogging, jogging around uh, in the pits, uh, if you have a stationary bike, that can help, especially one that works your arms and legs. Uh, not everyone has that, obviously, at the amateur level. Pretty much no one has that. Uh, but, you know, as much as you can do that, that, that can help. And then all the other activities, you know, that, that's some of the basics that uh, hopefully most people try before seeking medical treatment. And, and uh, training on a routine basis, like I said, my, my problem was uh, lack of training when I had my uh, arm pump recently. Um, and then overtraining. People can overtrain too much and the muscles are fatigued and they don't have the time to recover. They don't have the time to rebuild. Um, icing. So if it is a problem or seems to be a problem, you can ice the area that decreases the swelling, helps to get um, uh, the fluid out. 
uh, bike setup, you want to make sure you have a comfortable bike. That's fairly obvious. Um, muscle stretching, uh, you want to, again, make sure the muscles are ready to go. It, it's just like, again, you know, I, I keep going back and forth with the analogy to the, uh, to the bike uh, versus uh, your body. It's the same thing you do, right? I mean, before you go out there and ride, you check the fuel, you check the hoses, you check the, uh, your clutch, you check your brakes, you, you make sure everything's the way you like it, and then you warm up your bike, right? Well, you, you, you've apparently not seen the maintenance program of some of the guys that I know and work with, but yes, I, I, I get, I get your point guys. You know who you are. You don't take care of your stuff. Uh, yeah. We're, we're talking the ideal situation here, right? Whether someone listens to us or not, that's a different story. Okay. Yeah. Let's keep on that ideal, ideal situations. <laughs> this is what you should do. Now, again, uh, do we both do all this? Probably not, but um, it, it's what you should do. Uh, strength training, you know, keeping on your core and then lower body. Uh, as you know, your lower body can can help compensate for your upper body if there's asymmetries or or differences in strength. And and then you know, getting into the more of the medical treatment, the physical therapy. I, I've seen a lot of people try this to varying degrees: the dry needling, the cupping, deep tissue massage. Uh, a lot of that's to help with blood flow and, and help with uh, relaxing of the muscles. So, you know, all these things above uh, surgery here are, are some of the classic treatments that uh, you definitely want to try. So, you know, again, I, I would encourage people to, to attempt these things first before uh, seeking medical care. Yeah. And I, I was going to add one more bullet point, And this is something I was looking to help out the other racers is I was going to get a very angry pet badger. And I was going to rent them out at races and we chuck the racer in with the badger in the trailer and we'll rent it out for like three minute intervals. And as they run around trying to escape the ferocious badger, once you let them out of the trailer, they should be ready for the starting line and we'll just kind of start a process. Well, you know, if you do that, we can eliminate several of these uh, bullet points here. <laughs> I think <laughs> call it badger therapy. And then, you know, we, we can shorten this slide here quite a bit with that. <laughs> oh, yeah. I mean, it gets the adrenaline, anxiety, all of that stuff. It's just uh, basically, you know, trying to survive definitely checks a lot of ticks, a lot of boxes. Absolutely. And then, you know, the final thing on classic treatment before we, uh, before we get into some of the stuff that I'm doing is, is surgery and, and fasciotomies. But, you know, as I mentioned in, in one of the fact, uh, facts early on, surgery should really be the last resort. There's no such thing as a great surgery. Uh, surgery should be used to fix a, a specific problem when all other solutions have been exhausted. And, and you know, I, I don't want to overemphasize that, but uh, you can have problems after surgery. Scar tissue can form. Uh, you can have nerve damage. Um, uh, you can even have the arm pump or compartment syndrome come back. We've seen that many times, especially in the legs, uh, where surgeries have failed. And that's because, again, you, you have to close the tissue. And, and when that happens, scar forms and you have a new compartment. It's a pseudo compartment, but it's a new compartment. And those areas can be just as symptomatic and sometimes even worse uh, uh, down the road. So surgery, surgery doesn't guarantee a success. Uh, it's just an option, and it should be, in my opinion, the last option that people seek. And and you've done some research on this. I mean, you you know yeah. what surgery is like. Yeah, especially with the fasciotomies, it, it almost boiled down to a fifty-fifty at best. And you know, there's a lot of stars that have had fasciotomies. Caleb Russell had his arms filleted, and. I'm not sure. I've not talked to him personally <clears throat> how it's worked out. And then I did some research on Danny Pedrosa, who's a super famous GP, a GP racer, you know, the bullet bikes. And I believe he had two or three separate surgeries and they didn't help. He got scar tissue and made it worse. And then he basically some type of cupping procedure seemed to help it but uh again it was it, it wasn't uh hey i got the surgery and i'm all good and the more i researched it just it just looked like it wasn't a high percentage thing and when you're flying your arms open from your wrist to almost your elbow i would like to have a little more assurance that it's going to be a success if you're going to do something that radical 
Yeah, absolutely. And scar tissue, I, I think it's overlooked quite a bit. And, and that's usually the number one problem after the surgeries. Uh, the other thing, it changes the mechanics, right? So if you have a tight covering over the muscle that's keeping them in line, if you cut that and, and allow the muscles to sort of uh, uh, bulge out more, um, you're changing the mechanical uh, direction of those muscles just a bit. So some, some racers, uh, some individuals with compartment syndrome afterwards, uh, uh, can't really function the way they used to, to the same degree. Um, so, you know, again, with surgery, it, it, it serves a purpose in some cases, but uh, really that should be the last resort. You can't go back after surgery. All these other things above, and, and even the treatment we're going to talk about that I do, all of those things, you, you, you still haven't permanently damaged or changed anything. Um, but when you have surgery, uh, you know, there's actually a cut, there's a scalpel, there's scar tissue. Uh, so you, you can't go backwards from that. And we've had to treat patients that have had surgeries, failed surgeries before. It is more challenging. It, it, it definitely, there's a success rate with it. But um, after surgery, it does make things a little bit more challenging. Yeah, it's pretty rough. We've, I've done a fair amount of revision orthopedic surgery over the years and some of the scar tissue and joint capsule scar tissue is amazing how certain patients just produce abnormal amounts of scar tissue which becomes a whole another problem in itself so and, and you never know you really don't know ahead of time uh, as far as how that how that's going to turn out so fortunately we have a new solution for this <laughs> we'll uh Good segue. Good segue. I like it. <laughs> um, yeah. And I show the picture here with the, with the traffic jam on the road. Uh, that's essentially what's happening. And, and that blood flow is getting backed up. It's getting backed up into the forearms. You're getting that swelling in the forearm. So the solution is not, not to widen the road in that area, right? Because they're, they're still, the cars can't get through. Um, the, the solution is to open the roads and, and fix the uh, accident that's there down the road. Um, so instead of treating the symptoms, which is what, you know, surgery is essentially treating, uh, treating the swelling or the pressure in the forearms, uh, what we're going to talk about here, and we're going to use you as an example, is diagnosing and looking at it as the actual core problem. And if you treat the problem, if you open the road, then the symptoms go away, the congestion goes away. And by returning the blood flow to normal, that reduces that pain and pressure in the forearms, that uh, normalizes that fluid, so that fluid will go back into the blood vessels, into the capillaries, and uh, the, the symptoms go away. So we'll be addressing the problem rather than the symptoms will be this new approach that we talk about. So as you mentioned, uh, this was covered to any, anyone that's uh, uh, listening, you know, you can look these articles up online and everything else, but uh, July 2019 and February 2019 were the two um, uh, discussions on this. They actually showed some of the uh, images of, of patients that I treated in the past and uh, showed some of the imaging studies that looked fairly similar to, to yours. And, you know, it has a, it has a feel, and, and you talked about it, that it, uh, it, it seems too simple. It seems like, man, why, why isn't everyone doing this? Why, uh, where, where has this been all the time? Um, but really, you know, these articles give a good background and perspective on that and talk about how this works. Um, we're using uh, botulinum toxin or, or Botox uh, for what a lot of people know. And, um, you know, it, it works great. And this, this procedure is... Uh, a, a simple solution to a complex problem, but uh, really changes a lot of people's lives, changes their ability to get back out there and get out the sports. Super. All right. We're going to look at the cool pictures here pretty soon, I think. Yes. All right. So do you, do you want to take this or do you want me to take this part? <laughs> no, no. What we have, we have uh, two top sirloins that are not exactly identical and, uh, Dr. McGinley is going to explain exactly what's going on here. Yeah, so these these are your forearm images uh, from an MRI study, and and for those uh, viewers out there, this is a lot of muscle. Uh, so they, these are uh, um, uh, above average muscle strength forearms. I can tell you that for sure. But really, it, it highlights the point and and highlights what's happening. And you know, if you look at the image uh, that's labeled rest uh, on the on the left side. That's what uh, your forearms look like when you just walked in and, and we scanned you without you doing anything. And, and what you can see there is the color, uh, that gray area, that, that darker color. Um, those are all your muscles. The black, the black structures in the middle, those are bones in your forearm. So these are cross sections. So you're, you're doing slices through the forearm. So the, black, the dark black areas are your bone. The gray areas are your muscle. 
And then all those white things uh, that are floating around there, those are all your veins. So those are all your blood vessels uh, within the forearm. So that's what it looks like at rest. Most, uh, most of the muscle looks like a grayish color and, and it all looks pretty much the same. Then we put you through a little bit of a workout routine there uh, uh, with your forearms. So we had you exercise your forearms. And what you can see on that picture on the right labeled arm pump, some of those muscles don't look like others, right? So you can see a big difference uh, within some of the muscle groups, they're bright. Uh, so they, they look much brighter, especially compared to the resting image. And then uh, even within the forearm, some muscles are bright and others aren't. That's the swelling we talked about. So that's that fluid uh, looks bright on MRI, just like the veins on that left side are bright. There's fluid in the veins. Uh, on that right side, there's fluid now leaking into the muscle. And, and that's when you were symptomatic. That, that's what your muscle looked like. Now, the other thing that you can probably catch your eye, that's a big difference. So these slices were taking at approximately the same location in the forearm. What, what can you no longer see on those images? The veins, right? They're all squashed out. So these, these bright white tubes that you're seeing on the resting images are no longer present. They're all squashed. And that's because these muscles, uh, the bright areas of the muscles have gotten so swollen that they're further blocking the blood flow by compressing the muscles themselves or compressing the veins themselves. So the veins disappeared and you're seeing all this visual swelling there in your muscles. And, you know, you can tell them what you felt like at that point. I mean, your, your forearms were pretty pumped up at that point. Oh, yeah. Basically, at that point, they're on fire. And maybe I was being a bit dramatic, but the veins are definitely shut down. But I thought you may have even said that my artery itself was shut down as well. Uh, that's correct. You, you don't see the artery as much on these particular images. Those, be, those will be on the ones coming up. But yes, your, your artery was compressing as well, uh, which puts you in a much more severe category. You know, uh, the, we're going to get into the nitty gritty in that part of the conversation. But um, for, for the listeners out there, veins are, are sort of very low pressure. You know, if you, if you push your veins on your hands and, and everything else, they compress very easily. However, your arteries are your pulse. So when you feel your pulse, like if you feel your pulse up on your neck, or feel your pulse on your wrist, you actually have to push pretty hard to feel the pulse. So the, the pressure, the pressure difference is about 100 in an artery, and it's about four in a vein, millimeters of mercury. So that's, that's a pretty big variable difference between arteries and veins. So arteries are essentially your blood pressure and veins have very little pressure. That gives us an assessment of how bad your compartment syndrome or your arm pump is, because if it's compressing the vein, okay, that, that's fine. It's, it's lower end pressure, but once it starts pressing the artery, um, now you're at a much, much more severe level of, of arm pump. And, and it gives us an assessment of relatively uh, how bad you are in those situations. So I just want to point out is with people, if you go back to that prior slide, for the people out there, um, you know, at first, if you just look at these, you go, ah, they basically look like two giant hunks of meat, which you'd be correct. But if you look at the arm pump one, the big thing to notice, like if you look at the upper right at about one o'clock, what he's, what Dr. McGinley's talking about is it's almost a teardrop and you can see how bright it is. Um, super bright. That's the high pressure. That's and it's pushed the other muscles away. And again, you see none of those bright stripes, barely, which, which are the veins. It's been totally shut down. So the muscle that's, that looks more white or more bright, those are the ones that are getting just hammered with, with blood and, and backfill. Yeah, and, and you can see that a little bit more. So on this one, I, I was uh, pointing out more of the veins because it just showed up easier on this slide. Uh, so if we go to the next slide here, you can actually see that difference a lot more clearly uh, right. uh, uh, towards the nine o'clock position. All of those muscles are, uh, are the forearm muscles on the top of the forearm, and they are all super bright. Uh, so that, that white area in the muscle, this is the same. This is you at rest and with arm pump, just a different uh, level within the muscles. And you can clearly see the difference uh, um, uh, from side to side there. And, and you also get a feel for the veins, although the, the last slide was a little bit more prominent on the veins. This one, you can clearly see the swelling within the muscle. Oh, wow. Yeah. So that, that's what the MRI looks like. And this is what we use to essentially make the diagnosis. Um, you know, we want to make sure that we identify where the problem is occurring. We want to look at the muscles 
uh, as you see, it's not symmetric, right? So that, that image of arm pump, it's not every muscle that's bright. It's very specific muscles. And there are muscles directly next to the abnormal ones that are still normal. Uh, so, you know, the, the MRI is very important to tell us first, if you do have uh, a compartment syndrome, and uh, if you do, where it's occurring, how bad it's occurring, and how far it goes up and down the forearm. So a lot of information on these scans. Again, we don't expect everyone to be experts in looking at MRIs, but uh, these are pretty self-explanatory when you can see the brightness. And brightness means swelling, brightness means pain. So uh, that's, uh, uh, that's essentially what we're seeing on that right-sided picture there. See, I'm pretty bright. <laughs> uh, now, the next thing we do is, is the CAT scan, right? So when you came in, uh, we did two different types of imaging studies. We, we had you in the MRI, and then we had you over in the CAT scanner, and, and we're getting two different bits of information on there. Um, now, the, the pictures uh, on the left of the person holding the grip dynamometer, that's not you, obviously. Those forearms are about half your size. Um, so that, that's uh, just a stock photo we have from one of our other patients. And, but this is how we scanned you. So we had you hold essentially a grip dynamometer, squeeze it as hard as you can. We documented how hard you were squeezing. And while we were squeezing, we injected dye into your blood vessels and generated a CT scan. Uh, the image on the right is essentially a three-dimensional image, that is you, uh, of the CAT scan and your blood vessel. So you can see up top, uh, these are all your bones. All these white structures are your bones. And then these devices up here, that's that grip dynamometer. You can see the little uh, curly part of it uh, over here. And then all these structures down here, these are your blood vessels. So these are your arteries and veins uh, that are flowing through your arms. Uh, so that's what that looks like. So that's that part of the scan is the CAT scan. And what we're looking for is that relationship of compression, relationship of the muscle relative to the blood vessel. That, that's going to be the key point. That's what we target. That's the problem. That's what we're looking for when we try to fix this. Man, I didn't realize that skeletal, the animated skeletal picture, that that was me. You need to sell those. I'm going to get that printed on a t-shirt and like says like Pink Floyd or Led Zeppelin or something. That is awesome. I may even get a tattoo of that. Yeah, we could we could generate some really cool images. I mean, I can edit that however you like, just like you can do the animation there with the uh, circus bear. Um, I can get you some cool ones here of the of the cat scan images of your bones and blood vessels, and we can even add in some muscles if you like on those. That's uh, uh, some of the coolness of the technologies that we have available. I'm digging it. the uh, The dynamometers look like uh, pistols from space. That's good stuff. Yep, that's exactly right. So yeah, there we go. So we're we're getting all type of other uh, side business things going. Here. Yeah, we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna get an apparel line of your own CT. Like that's that's not just a skull on my shirt. That is my skull. <laughs> um, and then this is what that looks like. So now getting back into the more boring pictures of not the three dimensional stuff. Uh, these are the slices through your forearm, and and on a CAT scan, bones are now bright. Uh, so a little bit different than the MRI. On the CAT scan, uh, bones are bright, uh, as well as the contrast. So contrast is relative to the density of a structure. So bones are really dense, they're really hard. The contrast that we inject into your blood vessel, that's also really bright. And what you're seeing uh, of the image on the left, you're seeing this tubular structure that has some bright stuff in it. That's the contrast within the uh, arteries and veins. And then on the right side, that's when you were gripping and we scanned you again. And we, we literally can't see anything. So all of the veins, the arteries are completely compressed. And without showing the one on the left, I mean, you'd have no idea what you were looking at here, the one on the right. Um, but you had fairly significant compression just by gripping against that dynamometer uh, in the CAT scanner. So um, very important to use both images because what, what this tells us is... Um, we knew you were positive uh, uh, on the MRI, but what this tells us is where the problem is actually occurring and what we need to target. So, you know, if you see those muscles squishing those blood vessels there and completely compressing them, then that, that's where we're going to target. That's the problem. Um, that's where we're going to direct the needles. That's where we're going to direct your treatment. Yeah, I, for veins compressed, I have a new term. We're going to call it blacked out. <laughs> uh, they are that's completely gone there i mean that that was that's pretty impressive and and again i i had to put the other one next to it just so you know you can even see what i'm talking about otherwise it, everything's just all gray there's nothing there wow that's cool it'd be even cooler if it wasn't my arm but 
<laughs> um, yeah, but the story wouldn't be as good, right? I mean, that's, True. Uh, <laughs> uh, so how do we treat this? Uh, opening the roads is what we talked about. Now, this is not your picture. So for all your viewers there, this is not you <laughs> uh, getting the Botox. Um, you know, but Botox is what we use classically. But, you know, part of the problem is, is the is the perception of what Botox is used for and, uh, and, and nothing else. And when you say Botox, right, when you and I first talked and, and we said, how do you do this? And we said, oh, we usually use Botox or one of the other toxins. Um, you know, you, you had to do some research. You didn't just immediately believe me. And, and that's because of the picture in the middle. That's what most people think of, of Botox and that's what it's used for. Um, but that's not the case. And I, I mean, you can probably give a better story on that than I can, but you know, I know you were skeptical at first. A lot of people are when they first hear about this. Oh yeah. You know, you hear Botox and you think about, uh, celebrities and, you know, is my ass fat and, uh, you know, so you're like, but then mechanically you explain it and it deactivates the contraction of muscle and we're, we have a problem with muscle over contracting. So all of a sudden it starts to make sense. Yep. And you hit the nail on the head. Uh, botulinum toxin or Botox uh, is one of the commercially forms of this. Um, it does a great job at paralyzing muscle. I mean, that's how it makes wrinkles go away and, and does a wonderful job at it. Uh, so in, in sports medicine, the way we use it in orthopedic care, uh, we use Botox to manipulate muscle. And when done correctly, it, it does a just a wonderful job. And that picture on the right, that's a forearm with a couple of the needles in that we use for treatment. That, that's not your picture, but uh, that's another one that we use where uh, the needles are directed into very, very specific area. You can see the areas are marked. There's black Sharpies on there. Uh, that matches the images that were on that CAT scan. And we use ultrasound to very precisely place those needles. You can barely see the needles in those pictures. Um, but we want to make sure that it's done exactly right because, you know, there's a trade-off, right? If you're paralyzing muscle at some point, uh, if you paralyze too much muscle, then you're back to the same problem where you can't hold the grips, you can't hold on to the handlebars. Um, so it's a, it's a very precise uh, directed injection where we're targeting only those areas of muscle that we saw compressing and abnormal in that CAT scan. And then by doing that, we're minimizing the risk, we're minimizing the potential downside of the procedure. Uh, so that's the beauty of Botox is being able to manipulate muscle. Uh, that's where biomechanics come back into it because if you understand how the forearms work, you understand the, the muscle function, um, you can actually manipulate very small pieces of the muscle to get the desired results that you need um, to get you back out there competing, get you back out on the bike. Yeah, and you have a pretty impressive space helmet for your ultrasound. <laughs> yeah, that's augmented reality. You know, we, uh, uh, you know, what, what you're referring to here is is how we combine technologies. And um, as you know, you came out and visited here. I'm I'm very into technology. I like to use the latest and greatest of all my technologies. And uh, you know, we have this headset that comes on. It, you know, it looks like um, uh, it looks like we're about to blast off on a, on a NASA or a SpaceX flight. And, but what it does is it shows me the ultrasound images. It lays the images right over the forearm as I'm working. And I can see everything else in the room just normally, but uh, those technologies are what makes this happen. I mean, uh, I, I love using whatever's the best to, to treat patients and uh, to make these outcomes even better. And, and plus it looks cool, but you know, that's, oh, a, yeah. that's a side I, effect. I, I, kinda, I kinda felt a little envy. I was like, well, where, where's my helmet? <laughs> but um yeah so that that's where that's where we go with that and you know it, when we're talking about um results with this so, you know the the data really speaks for itself we, you know we i developed this procedure I, I was as you mentioned i was the first to develop this and it was because i took a different approach saying you know it seems odd that someone that's as athletic as yourself that you're being impaired in both of your forearms uh by the same thing i mean it just didn't make sense so looking into what causes it and identifying that blood vessel compression, that, that blocked road, the tailpipe example, um, being able to identify that really is a game changer. And, and as you mentioned, we were actually able to get a patent on that procedure because of that. And it's extremely hard in medicine to get a patent, especially on a medical procedure uh, itself. But this was so unique. It was such a different approach to it. It made sense. And, and we were able to do that. So that was back in 2011 when we first developed this procedure. And We've treated over 800 patients to date in, in mostly lower extremity, but uh, upper extremity as well. 
uh, with a success rate of 87%. There's very, very few medical procedures out there, especially ones that are minimally invasive, uh, that have success rates that high. And, you know, it's great. It, it's, it's better for the patient. It, it results in um, less complication uh, profile, lower risk, and, and you get back out there sooner. I mean, that you experience that yourself. Well, the success rate definitely hit my threshold because I typically believe 60% of the time it works every time. So <laughs> try to figure that, try to figure that one out. <laughs> That's still better than the surgery success rate, right? <laughs> true. True. That's the uh, Ron Burgundy success rate. <laughs> um, so yeah, you know, those are the outcomes and getting into the procedure, you know, it, it, it's probably best for you to explain that, but, um, you know, the, the, you came in as a patient. So, uh, having me tell it is one thing, but, uh, why don't you, why don't you give your experience on how this worked? I mean, that, that's probably best for your listeners to hear. Well, it was pretty cool. You know, first you show up for the MRI and they handed me, they took a couple, uh, rest MRIs of my forearms, but I was too big to fit in the MRI barrel and I got stuck. And so we had to do each arm separately. So that was an interesting story in itself. Then they gave me these rubber balls and they're just like, well, you know, start getting arm pump. And I'm like, well, I have to be afraid and have adrenaline too. Cause you know, that's what's going on when you, they let you loose in a race. And uh, so I started pumping on these balls and one ball wasn't doing it. So I grabbed two in a, in, in each, you know, two in each hand and you, you know, you're squeezing them. And it was interesting because as you start to lose dexterity, it's hard to keep both of them in your hands. Cause like one's wanting to shoot off, you know, and drop on the floor. I'm like, nah, don't drop it. You, so you're kind of, and it actually worked pretty well because you're basically re-gripping every time you squeeze trying to make sure one doesn't slip out and the ladies are there and it'd been like 30 seconds and they're like, you know, are, are you done yet? And I'm like, no. <laughs> and then it's like two minutes. Are you done yet? No. Three minutes. Are you done yet? No. Four minutes, five minutes, six minutes. Because I was thinking, Hey man, I've came to Casper, Wyoming and they're trying to assess if I have a problem. This is not the time to be a wimp with the rubber balls. So I literally went at it with reckless abandon, seven minutes approximately. I couldn't even feel, feel my hands. And so we did those MRIs and then I went up to the CAT scan clinic. Uh, they give you an IV. They set it up so that when you're in the machine, they tell you when they're going to put the contrast in your blood. I had never had that done before. They're like, Hey, you may feel like you're going to wet your pet. You like you wet your pants, but don't worry. You didn't. And I was like, what have I got myself into? And, uh, so that happened and, and, and it was pretty interesting. I'm going to leave that for everyone to experience. Not bad, just different. And, uh, so we got that done. We gripped the dinometers. I wanted to make sure I got the record and, uh, cause it, it measures, uh, your grip strength and, from there, they sent the images over to your office, Dr. McGinley's office, went in there, you reviewed them. And, and I think it's important at first, anytime you have anything done, you want to make sure you got a problem. And so that's what the MRIs were for. And I said, Hey, all right, you know, you definitely have, you know, basically exertional compartment syndrome and set up to do the injections. And I believe there were five needles for each arm and they're small, you know, they're small needles and yeah, you know, it's like, Hey, do you want anesthesia, you know, for the injections? And I was like, well, do I, <laughs> and, and he's like, well, you know, the, the injections themselves hurt less than the, the anesthetic. So like, all right, well, let's just go for it. And he put on the Captain Kirk space helmet and put five needles in one arm and did the injections, did five needles in the other arm. And I essentially walked out and essentially drove home. Um, no downtime, no pain. Um, they didn't hurt that night. It didn't hurt the next day. There was essentially 
no pain whatsoever. Um, which is, which is pretty cool. And I got lucky that we did it. There's kind of a 28 day protocol and it was kind of nice because we did it essentially December 1st. So I could align the days of the protocol with the days of the month and went great. Um, really had no downtime. Uh, there was only three or four days, um, where I was not supposed to, you know, ride just because, you know, they didn't know what my grip strength was going to be. And other than that, um, man, it's been pretty awesome so far. I've done typical laps where I've timed them and I knew the physical exertion so I could compare them to the prior year and literally increase my workload 300%. So pretty cool stuff. Yeah, I remember chatting with you after that too. And, and you know, what I thought was great was, uh, you know, you mentioned that, uh, you know, I, I think either your cardiovascular endurance or your leg strength was uh, now the, the weaker link of the bunch <laughs> after that. And I got a kick out of that, that's for sure. <laughs> yeah, it, it kind of checked my card because, you know, I've always had a reputation for, you know, never getting tired and just, you know, crushing along. And I, I wonder if, well, since I was, basically having to ride like the circus bear for an hour. That was another way of saving energy. And, you know, then when I finally prairie dog and pop up, you know, I have all this energy to, to use. And now again, I kind of felt like, holy cow, like I'm starting to feel my legs I'm starting to feel this. I'm like, man, I'm gonna have to pick it up. <laughs> so maybe my arms aren't the, you know, all of a sudden are not the uh, limiting factor. So it's a good problem to have. Yeah, absolutely. I have to refer you back to that early slide with the bullet points, with the training and everything, right? <laughs> oh yeah. I gotta, I gotta re, I gotta revisit. Well, they say life's, you know, you know, cyclical, right? <laughs> so, yeah. But that, you're fact, right. That is a, it's a good problem, right? Because, it, you know, it gets you back to, um, uh, competing. And now, you know, you can push your endurance, you can push your training in other levels and you're not focusing on your forearms as much. And, you know, I, I again, remember talking to you and that psychological component still creeps in because you're not used to it. Uh, I'm sure after you left, after we did that injection, you're probably like, ah, this isn't going to work. And, um, you know, we see that all the time as well. And then when it does, it's like, it's a life-changing thing. And then, you know, you, you typically are like, was that just a lucky ride or is that going to work every time? And, and we see that commonly. And, and I know even you and I chatted a bit, uh, uh, that was part of your experience too, is that, that doubt that still seeps in until, until you really get out there and experience it multiple times. Yeah. I would like to back it up because it's hard, you know, it's, you get used to it, but it's been such a painful experience, you know, for the last several years that, it's hard to get it completely out of your mind and it'll, it'll come. And it's, it's really exciting for me not, not to have it. And, you know, and one of the things that I was wondering was grip strength, but funny enough, I think you and I had a good understanding with each other where some people are concerned like, Hey, you may lose, you know, whatever, if it's a few percent or 5% grip strength and, and that really actually wasn't an issue with me because I looked at it maybe a different way where, well, say you lost 10% of your grip strength. What would that mean? Well, I can tell you in the first hour plus of a race, I've lost 80% of my grip strength. So overall, I'd be way ahead running at 90. And at no time did I ever lose the handlebars and you know we're doing some pretty aggressive trials techniques where we're launching these bikes and i've i've lost the grips from having hand pump where just one hand blows off and i tell you what uh things uh things downward spiral really quick when you <laughs> lose one side of the handlebars you know in a particular situation and quite honestly knock on wood we have wood uh, there was no time during any of this, uh, you know, post the procedure that I ever lost control of the handlebars. I just felt like my arms were more supple and more control, uh, more relaxed, really. 
Yeah, I mean, that's a that's an excellent point. That's a perfect description. And, and that conversation comes up all the time uh, with patients because, you know, they, they'll say, well, you're using Botox, you're paralyzing muscle. Am I going to lose strength? Well, that's a that's a relative discussion, because if you can't ride and you can't grip right now, um, then then the problem, the symptoms that you have are exceptionally worse than the risk of the procedure and any even potential weakness that may occur. And, and, you know, even putting that aside, we're blocking such a small area of muscle and that gets back to the precision of it. We're blocking only what we need to block and we're blocking just the areas around those blood vessels where the abnormality is located uh, and precisely doing that. Um, so, you know, we minimize the amount that's being blocked and, and by doing that, you're getting back out there and competing to a level that you just couldn't compete at before. Uh, so that, that was an excellent description. And that's what we try to, to relate to people when they come in uh, all the time. That, that question comes up frequently. Oh, I like it. It gives me a reason to, now I have to get rid of my other excuses. Dang. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, we can get into that for sure. Yeah. Um, that, that's, that's more of a Freud discussion probably. <laughs> Uh, and, and as you mentioned, information on this, there's a lot out there, both for the upper and lower extremity. We talked about the, the motocross magazines. Uh, for the lower extremity, we've been in Runner's World magazine, which is you know one of the top running magazines. Uh, this has been on CBS, NBC, a whole bunch of stuff. So you know, I would encourage uh, people listening to, to look it up and, and try to understand it for themselves and, and make their own conclusions on what they need for their own treatments and care. But a lot of good information out there on it. So, you know, coming back to this, hopefully at the end of this conversation, and then we'll get into your recent race, because I, I think that probably sort of brings it all together from the patient side of things. But from the treatment side of things, um, this is back to that tourniquet. And that's what's happening. So if you say, well, what's the bottom line without all the medical uh, uh, um, messaging and everything else? What's the bottom line here? And what's the problem? It's that tourniquet. So uh, just like when you give blood and you put a tourniquet on your upper arm, it makes all your veins come out in your forearm. Uh, what it's doing is blocking the flow so they can easily get an IV in. If you put that tourniquet on and crank on it and leave it there, you'll get forearm compartment syndrome. You'll get arm pump. So the solution to that problem is not to cut open the forearm in hand. The solution is to remove the tourniquet, right? I mean, that, that's how you would fix that. Same thing in the forearm. What's happening now is that vein is being compressed from the muscle. So the solution is to remove that compression, remove that tourniquet, and then the symptoms will go away. And it's literally that simple. This problem is that simple. I, I don't want to encourage anyone to try this, but if you do that, uh, you'll get, if you leave it on there, you will get compartment syndrome in your forearm. Don't do it because there's some bad side effects if you leave it on for too long, but uh, it does replicate it nicely. And don't do it to your friends either. <laughs> yeah, you do it to your friends. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> that's the way around that. Um, but, you know, really that, that's, uh, uh, that's the story of it. And, you know, I, I think your experience with the recent race is probably uh, an, an excellent summary of, of how all this went from where you were before, you know, your experience with um, deciding to come to Casper, Wyoming, right? Casper is not the Mecca of medicine and um, it's not known for it. And, you know, I, I practice out here just because of the beauty and outdoors, but, you know, we're, we're creating a, a top level sports center out here. We have a lot of athletes, Olympic and pro athletes from around the world that come in uh, for various medical treatments. But, you know, you were skeptical, just like a lot of other people. And it comes full circle when you, you go through that process, you come out, you research it, you make the decision, you get it done. And then, you know, you're back out there. You just had a race what last week and uh, results were impressive. <laughs> yeah, no doubt. Um, it was one of the, well, one of the only times where usually when I start off in a race, uh, you know, I can go all right for the first you know, five to 10 minutes. And then all of a sudden it's like tires and concrete and you're getting past and, you know, and that's fairly demoralizing, you know, when you've trained hard and you've tried to do all the right things and you know, you can do better, but you're literally just trying to do everything you can to move the bike forward. Cause you really can't hold on. And you just suffer through it and you hope it, you know, let's go sooner than later. And quite honestly, that never happened. And we had two, we had a qualifier and, um, with the qualifier, qualifier, you know, it was basically one class full pro, all the top dogs are there and 
came in 17th overall in the in the prologue and that was i don't know it was probably under an hour course uh you know pretty relentless and you know it really continued in t- into the main as well and it was an awesome experience for me to be able to ride and not be shut down and i just you know i relatively i didn't have you know really anyone passing me you know there's always you know a couple but nothing like before it was i was on the mark and i was moving forward and quite honestly my body was adjusting like holy cow well this isn't a problem you know now you're starting to like man why i feel my legs now and i feel this and i'm like geez man maybe i need to switch things up and which to me i I saw that as a as just a huge you know a lot of potential there and pretty excited about it for sure but to not have the arm shut down i tell you man it was it was awesome completely awesome yeah that was great and as you know you know i was texting you to find out how that race went and and the results were impressive that's top pros you're out there with and and um you know that that was uh impressive results and you know, as you and I talked to some people are probably asking, well, with Botox, is it going to last forever? And, uh, you know, you'll probably need another treatment, uh, possibly two down the road, but we do see permanent results from this uh, ultimately. And I, I think that's key for people to understand that this is not something that they have to get done all the time. It's not something that is only temporary, um, that there is ability to make this more of a permanent treatment by essentially reprogramming the muscle. So by using that uh, Botox in the same area of the muscle repetitively, uh, your muscle will develop new muscle memory. So we're not blocking the whole muscle. We're only blocking a portion of it. And then the rest of the, the muscle that's not blocked, that'll take over and it'll, it'll get new muscle memory. Just like, you know, if you had bad form on the bike, um, you know, you, you would uh, hopefully try to break that with the repetitive training, repetitive exercises, and then you don't even think about it anymore. Same thing in this situation, the training is the Botox and, and uh, this can be a permanent treatment for most people uh, with sometimes just two or three treatments. Yeah. I mean, that's good to know. It's good expectation setting. I think I've already felt it to some point where the muscles are working differently. And that makes sense. If, if you shut down muscles, they atrophy and other muscles have to take over the workload. And so I felt little difference in tendons, et cetera. But overall it's been, it's been quite incredible and I'm really excited to move forward. I'm actually looking forward to a second procedure. It doesn't, it doesn't really hurt. And, uh, you know, just to keep pushing this, you know, we hope to have a big, a big year this year with, we do a lot of riding, we're doing a lot of snow biking and basically getting after it. So yeah, it's a great, it's a great time to have free arms and a lot of riding to do. So we're pretty, we're pretty stoked. Yeah, I'm, I'm excited for you. I can't wait to see uh, uh, your results uh, this year in the summer and um, you know, hopefully things open back up and we try to get out there to some of the races. I, I enjoy going out there and watching the races as well. And, um, you know, getting, getting out there and, and seeing how you're doing and, and seeing how the races are going. I, that's, uh, uh, that'll be, that'll be fun. That's for sure. But, uh, yeah, you know, again, if, um, uh, we'll, we'll see if the listeners have questions or things like that that come up, I'd be glad to, to answer, as you know, our, our group and our staff are pretty receptive and, uh, pretty responsive, um, uh, to any and all questions. Uh, you know, we have a slide up here with the contact info for my, um, uh, nurse and patient care coordinator. So Julie Johnson's my care coordinator, Jen Galloway's my nurse, and, uh, that's our phone number website, uh, the McGinley clinic.com. Uh, we have a lot of information on there and, and pretty much if you reach out to any of these individuals, I'm going to hear about it, especially, uh, they know I'm fond of, of, uh, motorsports and motorcycle racing. So, uh, when you called in for the first time, I think I heard about it within like two minutes, uh, cause they know I, I ride and, and raced and everything else. And they reached out to me right away as soon as that contact came in. Yeah. You have a great team there. We were really happy. Uh, Julie, Jen, they were great. Um, felt really easy i mean you know you showed up everyone knew what was going on and it was impressive and like i said even to the point where i just want to continue the program and get this thing done with and you know if it takes a couple 
procedures. It takes a couple of procedures, but again, that's what makes it so uh, inviting is that it is less invasive. You're not out, you're really not sidelined uh, for, you know, really any significant amount of time. And yeah, it's definitely, I think the way to go if you have that problem. Yeah, absolutely. And, um, you know, th there's a lot to do out here in Wyoming as well. If you haven't been to Wyoming before, and, and before I moved out here, I, I, I don't have any relatives out here. My wife doesn't either. And, um, you know, we just found it just absolutely amazing. There's so much to do out here. If you're into fishing, the North Platte River runs right through the middle of town. It, it's world-class fly fishing, literally like two minutes away. Um, and, you know, we have the mountains out here. So, you know, we have a lot of people that make it almost like a, a destination week and, and take some time off and, and enjoy the countryside. A couple hours away, you can get out to Yellowstone. So, uh, you know, quite a bit to do uh, in Wyoming, especially if you haven't been out here. If you're from the coast, uh, you'll just be shocked at the open the open area. And, you know, you drove down, so you, you got to see it. And, but you're from this part of the part of the country now anyway. But from coming from the coast, it, it can be shocking just how much open area there is and how much open land there is. Well, we could probably send you some Californians. Do you need any of those? <laughs> if they have arm pump, sure. <laughs> Only if you got arm pump. If not, you have to go home. <laughs> I All guess right. I came uh, via California, so that's that's fine, right? I was out there seven, eight years before coming out here. Um, no, no, no harm, no foul. That's right. And, and this is my contact info. This is my personal email. Um, you know, so feel free to reach out to me. It's McGinley at McGinleyClinic.com. Um, I'm pretty responsive myself. That's, that's me responding to those emails. Uh, so yeah, if you have any questions, you want to reach out to me directly, that's it. And you know, this is a picture. This is what it's all about. This is my son and I out there on the bikes, getting out onto the track. I think this is after the arm pump, but, uh, yeah, this is us getting out there and you can see part of the riding area there in the background. So fun stuff. That's for sure. Well, I love it. Well, we'll put your, uh, contacts also in the comments, et cetera, for the YouTube channel. And yeah, we'll put this together and man, great to have you. Uh, awesome information and yeah, it's interesting stuff. You got to love innovation. <laughs> great. Well, I enjoyed the conversation and, you know, again, um, uh, having, uh, your experience as the patient, I, I think is key because, uh, your perspective is much more important than my perspective on this and, and, and giving your experience, uh, I think really helps. And, uh, you know, it, it really is about doing what's best for the patient, making sure we can take care of the patient and, and getting them back out there. And uh, like I said, I'd be glad to answer any questions that come up afterwards and, and enjoy the conversation today. All right. Well, I'll do my best to uh, continue being a poorly trained test monkey. <laughs> well, well, we'll do what we can to keep you out there and then hopefully keep bumping you up the ladder there on the results. I like that. I like that. I got to stay on the track though. So, all right, man. Well, Hey, thank you so much. Uh, everybody. Thanks for tuning in. Uh, yeah, I think, I think everyone will find this, uh, super interesting and the contacts are there and until next time, everybody catch you later. Thanks, Dr. McGinley. Really appreciate having you on. Thank you. Appreciate it. All right. Cheers.